Hello everyone, welcome. My name is David Yaa Abraham and welcome to this YouTube channel. If you've been with us, then you know that we've been covering the book of Leviticus. If you're just joining us, welcome. Even though you've missed quite a lot, but you will be blessed. So on this channel, we've been going through the Bible, book by book. We've gone through the entire book of Genesis. We've gone through Leviticus, sorry, Exodus. And now we're in the book of Leviticus. We just started Leviticus. So please subscribe. If you really want to get an, a comprehensive understanding of the scriptures and what the Bible teaches, then this channel is for you. Please subscribe and you will be blessed. So getting straight into it, if you haven't watched the first video in this series of Leviticus, I highly recommend that you watch it before you watch this one because it lays a foundation for what we're going to be discussing today. So in the last video, we, just, we, we started discussing what it means to be called a priest. You know, the Bible says that we are kings and we are priests unto our God. And that it says we are kings and priests unto our God. But if you walk up to the average Christian and you just ask him, what does it mean to be a priest unto God? Most, most Christians won't have an answer to, to that question, what, what it means to be a priest. So from the last video, we're discussing what it means practically when a New Testament believer is called a priest to his God. So we're going to be continuing from where we stopped in the last video. And we'll be picking up from one of the points that we discussed. And one of it was holiness, right? Um, when you talk about the priesthood, right, there's no way you will understand what it means to be a priest with, without reading the Old Testament. If you've only read the New Testament and you just come across, come across scriptures that just talk about how you're a, you're, you're a king, you're a king and you're a priest, and you've never read anything in the Old Testament, you will, you will literally have no idea what that means. right? If you go up to anybody in the 21st century, today now and be like, I am a priest, the person has no idea what you're saying because they, don't, they didn't live in a time when priests were alive and people had temples and everything. So even you as a 21st century believer, if you haven't studied the Old Testament and studied the priesthood, the operation of the priesthood, and you just read scriptures in the New Testament that say we are kings and priests, you'll just be like, oh, hallelujah, I'm a king and a priest. But you really have no idea what that means. So from the last video, we, we, we already established that to understand what it means to be a priest unto your God, you have to have read, studied and understood the priesthood in the Old Testament. So, one of the things that was required for anybody to be called a priest is that he had to be holy. right? The entire nation of Israel was called to be holy. But the priesthood had to be holier. The level of holiness required to be called a priest was different. The level of cleanliness the level of separation, the things that they could not do, right? The things that were, there were things that were considered sinful for priests that were not sinful for other people. They had extra commandments because they were priests. So they had to be holy before they could present themselves unto God. So anybody who is going to be called a priest will not just be righteous by nature, right? But he has to be righteous even in his lifestyle. Because when you talk about righteousness nowadays, right, people say, people, so people get confused. They're like, I thought Jesus Christ has already made us righteous. We're already righteous by nature. Which is true, we are righteous by nature. But a priest is not only righteous by nature, he's righteous in his lifestyle. And it is the, the efficacy of a righteous lifestyle that makes a priest able to come near God. So anybody who is not living in righteousness cannot have an intimate relationship with God. He, can't be, he or she can't be close to God. You are saved and God loves you, but sin will always put a distance between a man and the holy God that we serve. Unless it's not Yahuwah, the God of the Bible, unless it's another God, but if it's the God of the Bible, then the person must be holy. 
you must be holy. So there's a difference between righteousness by nature and righteousness by action. Right? We are righteous by nature. And this righteousness by nature is supposed to produce righteous living. Righteous lifestyle. That's why Jesus says, by their fruits you shall know them. He doesn't say by their nature you shall know them. So somebody cannot be saved and be fornicating, fornicate today, fornicate tomorrow, fornicate tomorrow, fornicate next tomorrow, and say that I'm I'm a righteous man. You are deceiving yourself. You are utterly deceiving yourself. Because Jesus says we are we know the righteous words by their fruits. In other words, Jesus knows that you are righteous by nature. But that nature is supposed to produce a lifestyle of righteousness, a lifestyle of holiness. So, by nature, let's say you have some, some of us listening are probably married and you have children. Even if you are not married, you hope to be married one day, you hope to have a baby. So when you give birth to a child, by nature, the child is your child. By nature, he's your baby, he's your son, he's your, she's your daughter. So when you look at the child, by nature, the child is yours. So you love the child. But when the child takes a shit and there's poo all over your child, there's shit all over your child, your child smells like shit. At that moment, you're not comfortable holding the child. So a child who has just pooped, right? He has just taken a poo. You take off his pampas and he's smelling. There's poo everywhere. At that moment, you can't hug your child. You know the way a woman cuddles her baby and kisses the baby and holds the baby and plays with the baby and holds the baby tight when the baby is clean. When the baby has pooped, when the baby has taken a poo, you, that same woman will hold her nose around the baby because the baby stinks. So when God looks at us, by nature we are his children. But when you fornicate, you wrap yourself in shit. And when you wrap yourself in shit, it makes it difficult for God to, God to come near you. For God to be close to you. Just like you have a baby and you love the baby. Because all oh, people say, oh, God loves us, God loves us. You love your baby, but when he pulls you, don't hug him. You are not happy around the baby that is smelling of shit. You are looking for how you can wash him quickly. It's just so that you can hold it. Meanwhile, by nature, he's your son. So, in the Old Testament, people were not righteous by nature. What Jesus came, they were righteous by works. So it was righteousness by works. But when Jesus came and you accept Jesus and Jesus died, he made us righteous by nature. So when God looks at us, he sees us as his children. In the Old Testament, he didn't see people. people were not called the children of God. They were called the children of Israel. Because by nature, they were sinners. By nature, they were in God's children. So God couldn't call them his children. They were called the children of Israel, the sons of men, flesh, dust, people of the earth, whatever. But he says, as many as received him, he gave them the power to be called the sons of God. So it's when you receive Jesus that your nature changes, you become a son. So when God looks at you, by nature, he says, as many as received him, he gave them the power to be called the sons of God. So when you receive Jesus, he changes your nature. And instead of you to be by nature a sinner, right? By nature you are now righteous. So your son by nature is your son. But he can still wrap himself in shit. So anybody who is a fornicator, a liar, a cheat, a bribe collector, God loves him, is the truth. God loves everybody, even while we are sinners. But it's difficult for God to come close to you because you smell you smell of sin. You reek, you stink in the spirit. It's an abomination. When God sees, God sees sin, it's smelling. So God cannot be close to you. Let me read a scripture to you. John 15, 14. He says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. 
So the way Jesus, this is Jesus, by the way, this is not a human being speaking, right? This is Jesus. So the way Jesus identifies his friends is by those who obey him. You know how people sing this song? I am a friend of God. <laughs> Many people are jokers. They are serious jokers. They don't read their Bible. So they are just emotional Christians. You know, God loves us. I am a friend of God. A fornicator. <laughs> you don't know God. A bride collector. A liar. His father is the devil. He opens his mouth. He's spitting lies. And he comes to church. He's dancing. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Just shut up and keep quiet. Know your God. Understand God and don't be an emotional Christian. God is not emotional. So all this is an emotional. We're under grace. God just loves us anyhow. Then you just sin and think it doesn't matter. See, John 15, 14. How Jesus identifies his friends is by obedience. That's how Jesus knows his friends. That Jesus says, don't fornicate, and you truly did not fornicate. That's how he calls you friend. People just quote scriptures anyhow. They say, oh, I have, no, I have no longer called you servant. I now call you friend. So all of us are friends. Read it. There is a condition to be called a friend of God. It's obedience. That he says, thou shalt not lie. And everything that comes out of your mouth is true. That he says, flee sexual immorality. And because of that, you keep yourself. That he says, thou shalt not steal. And because of that, you don't collect bribe. So you obey God. And when you obey God, he calls you his friend. So you, are, you can be a son of God and not be his friend. Some of us have children that are not your friends. You don't talk to them. You don't have a cordial relationship with them. Because, either maybe because they are rebellious. So somebody has a child who is a drug dealer. You love him, but you hate his lifestyle. You utterly detest that your son sells cocaine. You hate the lifestyle, but you love him. And because the lifestyle is repulsive, it's difficult for you to establish a relationship with that child. You have a child who, God forbid, is a rapist. You love your child, but he's a rapist. But because the lifestyle is repulsive, you can't, you can't call him your friend. It's difficult for you to establish a relationship, to be close to that child. Because every time he comes near to you, you remember that this guy just raped a woman. I'm like, and you are like my son. Why are you doing this? Even if you want to be his friend, you want to talk to him, you want to just to him. By the time you remember that he raped somebody last week, and he's not changing, he's still looking for who to rape. You are it, it. It starts to bother you, and you're like, why are you not going to change? Why are you doing this? It's not right. So that rape, that lifestyle, it it forms a hindrance between the woman. And her child. That thing that the child is constantly doing, drug dealing, armed robbery, rape, rob, rebellion, or rape, it, it forms a, a blockade that the person cannot, you can't have a working, cordial, intimate relationship with that child because of the lifestyle. In other words, that child is not your friend. He's not your friend. You love him, he's your child, he's your son, but he's not your friend. So God has many children that are not his friends because they are rebellious. They live in sin. They deceive themselves, singing in church, I am a friend, I am a friend. Read your Bible. Don't just come and be singing, singing ignorant songs. They are not his friends because they don't obey. They live in sin, constantly fornicating. So they are not God's friends. Imagine if you have a friend that wraps himself in shit. This is your friend. When he takes a poop, he carries the sheets from the toilet. He puts his hand inside the toilet. He shits in the toilet. Then he puts his hand inside the toilet. He brings out the sheets. Then he smears himself with the sheets. Rubs the sheets all over himself. When he finishes rubbing the sheets all over himself, he now comes. and says, come, let me give you a hug. Will you hug that friend? After rubbing himself with sheets, smelling of sheets, then he comes and says, let, let, let's go and have lunch. We we go and have lunch with him while he's smelling of shit. But you love him as your friend. So why don't you go and have lunch with him while he's smelling of shit? This is how God sees sin. 
In the book of Isaiah says, your sins have put a distance between you and God. This is how God sees sin. He loves you, but the Bible says he hates sin. You know the way you hate shit? When you shit, you see your own shit. You can't even turn and look at it. When you finish taking the shit, you can't turn back. You are, it's so disgusting that you just quickly clean your bum bum. Quickly flush it because you don't want to see it. The Bible says, thou hated iniquity. God hates sin. He hates sin. Even if it's a, you think it's a small lie, but God hates it with a passion. So this is how we understand. This is the difference between righteousness by nature and righteousness by action. Because when you talk about Christians being acceptable, being righteous, people are confused. They're like, ah, Jesus has already died. We're already righteous. What's not the problem? But there's a righteousness by lifestyle. So when you obey God, as John 15, 14 says, he now calls you friend. You are now a friend. So he looks at you as not just his son, but you are his friend. So you know, the, like we are speaking of before, you can have a son who is rebellious. You love him passionately. So God still loves even Christians. Even people who are living in the world, God loves them. But a one who is a Christian, who is deliberately sinning, it doesn't change God's love for him. God still loves him. Just like a mother can love her son, who is a Jew, who is, I don't know, who is, who is an arm robber, who is a thief, breaks into people's houses with guns and cuts away their belongings. Because he's an arm robber, she still loves him. It doesn't change that he's her son. So she doesn't deny the person. And she loves him. So God loves even his children who are sinning. So even the child that is an arm robber, right? If the child is hungry and he comes to his mom and says, Mom, I'm hungry. I need some food. The fact that the person is an arm robber doesn't mean that I am. his mom will now say, Go and die of hunger. He's an arm robber. He comes and says, Mom, I'm hungry. I have not eaten for five days. Please, do you have rice? The mom will still give him food because she loves him. Irrespective of how the person lives his life, she still loves him. So a Christian living in sin can pray and God will still answer. He will confuse that answer to mean that God does not care about the fact that he's constantly fornicating. That God does not care. That, you know, as long as I prayed and God answered, it means that God, God, God likes the way I'm behaving. But anybody who has children knows that because you paid your children's school fees does not mean you're happy with them. You can have stubborn children who never obey you, rebellious, yet you are feeding them on a daily basis, yet you are putting food on the table, yet you buy them clothes, yet you send them to school. They are even giving you a headache. They are stressing you, and you wish that these children would just behave and obey you, but they are stubborn as goats. But even if they have stubbornness, you didn't drive them out of the house. You still provide for them. So God has many goats, stubborn goats, stressing him, giving him headache. But they don't even know they are goats. They just assume that after all, if God is not punishing me, if I pray and God still answers, then God is fine with my, my bribe collection. But God is not fine. The problem now is that you are not a friend of God. That's the problem. The problem now is that you have denied yourself of friendship with God. That's why many people truly don't have a relationship with God. It seems like it's just religion. Many Christians have this, there's this hollow, this, this emptiness. They come to church, they sing, they dance, they do the rituals, give offering, pay tithes, come for crossover service, beginning of year fasting and prayer. 40 days, 30 days, whatever. They do all the rituals, all of our service, Easter, Christmas. It's just rituals. But that true connection, there's no real connection with God. God is not really real to them. When you, people, other people talk about, I have a relationship. Like God is a person. He's my friend. I talk to him. He talks back to me. We are companions. It's not just that he's, he's giving me money. It's not just that he gave me a job. Like, God is my friend. There is a relationship. Like, when I'm lonely, I can speak to God and we will commune as friends. Many don't have it. They don't even have an idea what you're talking about. They have no idea. So, to them, it's just like, 
Let's just come and sing and dance and pay tithes and let God give us something. But there is an emptiness in their soul because there is a gap. There is a relationship, a friendship with the Most High that is supposed to have been established, but they, they deny themselves that because of fornication. So there are other things that... Hmm. There are other things that... that accompany friendship with God. When God calls you his friend, there are some things that accompany that thing. Because some people, are, in their mind, they are probably saying, what's the point of me being a friend of God? As long as he can give me some things, let him just pay my bills and, and give me a job and give me money. Why then do I need to call him a friend? But there are benefits of friendship. When truly, by holiness and obedience, you make yourself a friend of God. One of these benefits is answered prayers. One of these benefits is answered prayers. Let's read the scripture. First John three twenty two. He says that whatever we ask of him, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It says that when you ask God for something, you can be confident, ah, God, that God will give it to you. Like you come with your prayer request and you are sure that God will answer. Why? Because you keep his commandments. You obey him. That's why many of you don't have answered prayers. Or you have like 25 prayer requests and 24 are unanswered. 23 are unanswered. You have only two. You have things you have been praying about for years. It looks like God is just ignoring you. You are not his friend. Because you don't keep his commandments. You don't obey. You are a fornicator telling yourself you are under grace. You will suffer with those die of list of prayers. You will carry it into next year. You think it's a joke. Deceive your church. Deceive yourself in church. This is your year. Amen. Oh God, that prayer request, we'll see you with it next year. I bet you. You carried it from last year because you carried your fornication from last year. You think God is a fool. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. There are conditions to ensure that everything you bring to God, look at what he said. He said, whatsoever, whatsoever you ask God, he says he will do it. Not because he loves you. Huh? God is love. We're under grace. So let's live like godless fools. Fornicators, liars. And because God is love, you answer all that prayer. You will suffer in this economy. You will be shocked. You will suffer. You will be shocked. You are already suffering, self. You are feeling the pinch. You are feeling it. As you are praying, you are feeling it. And your prayers are unanswered. Do you know why? You are not a friend. He says that when you obey me, I now call you friend. And because you are my friend, I can't say no to you. Ah! That's why all your prayers will be answered. Because you are a friend. And people cannot say no to people they truly call their friends. So when you obey God, he calls you friend. When you now come and say, God, I need a job. I need more money. Because you are his friend, he will answer you. He can't say no. But the godless sinner telling himself is under grace. You will suffer with that prayer point. So now I can't come and ask you for your 100,000. Because you don't know me. I'm not your friend. Even if you, I come to your house naked, crying, I'm like, I'm so poor. God forbid, I'm so broke. Please give me 100,000. You're like, guy, I don't know you from anywhere. How can I give you 100,000? I don't know you. You're not my friend. You're not. But the one who is your friend, if he comes to your house, he didn't even ask you, He's just looking hungry. You say, have you eaten? You say, the friend say, ah, no, I've not eaten. You say, what's wrong? I don't have food. You say, take this 100,000. Go and buy food. You, he didn't even ask you. Because truly, this one is your friend. So when people establish friendship with God, 
They come with their request. He's, God can't refuse them. He can't. So he says, whatsoever. Whatsoever. Whatsoever, sir. How many of your prayers have not been answered? You've even abandoned those prayers. You pray this one year, two years, three years, every year. This is my year of establishment. My year of amen. When you finish, you fornicate like the devil himself. Fornicate. Spread your legs like a harlot. Calling yourself a virtuous woman. Spreading your legs like a prostitute. With every guy you are dating. Even the ones you are not dating, spread your legs like a harlot. Meanwhile, the God that you claim you love says flee sexual immorality. When you finish your harlot, you come, you smell like shit. God can't see you. He loves you, but you smell of harlot. You smell like a prostitute. It's, you stink before God. So when you come with that prayer, even that prayer is smelly. He can't answer it. He can't. So you have long list of prayer requests. God is not answering anyone. Maybe out of mercy, you now pick like two. You pick only two. And answer those two. Then you have, out of 20, you still have 18. And you are wondering, I thought God loves me. God loves you, but he has rules. He's not a fool. You love your child, but he cannot come around you smelling like shit. If you have a child who is a grown-up son, who can clean his buttocks, then he goes to poo. Then your 15-year-old son comes around you smelling like shit. You love him, but you say, get out of my sight. Go and clean yourself. Go and clean yourself! Come around God smelling of sin. Dancing in church! And smelling of sin. You suffer with your prayer requests. Let's look at another scripture. It says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. God does not hear sinners. But he says, But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, doeth, he does the will of God. He says, God hears this one. Oh, Kalabra, Kasila, Basata. Sir, these are New Testament. In case someone is going to say, Oh, this, the, 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 this thing sounds like God of the Old Testament. These are New Testament. I read 1 John 3 22. New Testament. This is John. Look at it. The book of John, New Testament, loving, gracious God. He doesn't hear sinners. And in case you thought the one that is calling a sinner is the one that has not given his life to Christ, he says, The one, he says, if any man do it, his will. He's not saying anybody who believes in him. You believe God by your eye for Nikita. What's the point? Just go and save Sita because you are doing the will of Sita. You believe God, you are a liar. You are like your father, the devil. You two of you are liars. What's the point of calling yourself the son of God? Why be being like your father, the devil? His mouth, you are wasting your time. So he says, if any man be a worshiper of God and do it, his will. You must do the will. It's not just why I'm a Christian. I believe. I have faith. You will suffer with your prayer request. See, you think this thing is a joke. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Continue. You already have many prayer requests that, that are just angry. You will suffer. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's not funny. You think this thing is a joke. Try this word of God. Forget the fact that I'm laughing. Try this word that says that answers prayers comes to those that do things that are pleasing to God. Try it. You say God is a God of love. We're under grace. Continue in your sin. Try this word and see how many of your prayers will be answered. So to establish friendship with God is done by holiness. So like we're saying, we're establishing the benefits of being a friend of God. Through holiness, through obedience, you establish yourself as friendship. In friendship with the one we call Elohim or Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible. You establish friendship by obedience. And the first benefit is intimacy, where God can truly come to you and be your friend. That's the first benefit. The second benefit, like I've spoken about, is answer prayers. Because people can't say no to their friends. They love their friends. And they, they do things for their friends that they will not do for strangers. People who call themselves sons, but they are, they are not their friends. The third benefit of friendship is that it opens you up to the secrets of God. So, now say, what am I doing with the secrets of God? Huh. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> the reason I'm going to tell you this story is so that you can understand what you, what you can do with the secrets of God. <laughs> uh, 
good. So in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. there were two men. One was called Abraham. The Bible establishes that Abraham was a friend of God. The second one was called Lot. And Lot was not a friend of God. The Bible never calls him a friend of God. So two of them are righteous men. The Bible calls Lot a righteous man. But Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was also a righteous man, but he's a friend of God. So two righteous men. One is a friend, one is not a friend. So God comes down from heaven. Physically. And visits his friend. But he doesn't go to he doesn't go to the house of Lot. He doesn't go to the house of Lot because Lot is not his friend. So he comes down physically, arrives at Abraham's house, and communion, fellowship, friendship with Abraham, but he doesn't visit Lot. The second thing he does for his friend is that he answers the prayer of Abraham, asking God for his son. And when God came physically, he said, by this time next year, Sarah will be a son. So answer prayer came to the friend of God. Lot still has his own unanswered prayers that he's praying about in Sodom and Gomorrah and God didn't answer him. God even visited him because he's not a friend. But remember that we're talking about the secrets of God. And when you're a friend, it opens you up. The Bible says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Psalm 25, 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. So when you establish friendship with God, through fearing God and therefore obeying Him. Because when you fear God, you obey Him. So through the fear of God and obedience, you establish friendship with God. Then the Bible says the secrets of the God can be committed to you. So the secrets of God. When God has a secret. You know people just say, oh, well, God loves everybody. God loves everybody. He doesn't tell everybody everything. God has secrets. There are things that God will not tell you if you're not His friend. Because the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. So when you establish friendship, God can now reveal his secrets to you. So when God came to the earth, he stood before Abraham. Then when he was about to leave, he said, ah, ah, can I hide this thing from Abraham? You know, that was having a secret. Is it possible that I can hide this thing from Abraham? You know, when you have this, your close friend, you want to travel abroad, you want to relocate. There are some of your friends that don't know you are relocating. You even traveled abroad. You've been there for five years. You've, you've changed continents. You have people that you didn't tell. You've been there for five years. They don't even know. But you have this, your friend. You can't travel without telling him. In, in fact, the moment that you just establish that, it looks like I'm about to travel. I'm having plans to travel. You call your friend and say, what do you think about this? When you start a new relationship, you meet a guy you like. The guy has not even told you anything. You just meet the guy, the guy is just handsome. You just, you just feel like, ah, this guy is somebody that will be interested in. You call your friend instantly. Instantly and say, ah, I just met somebody with the guy. He asked me for my number. I don't know whether he likes me. And so you are, you are already sharing the secret. Meanwhile, there are other people that you will not tell. Even as you start dating him, you will not tell them. Some of them is on the day of when you are getting married that they will even know you started a relationship. But your close friend... It's not possible. You're like, is it possible that I met somebody I like and I didn't tell this, my friend? You must tell him. You must tell her. So God stood before Abraham. When he was about to go, he said, I have a secret. I have a secret. I have a secret. He said, can I hide this thing from Abraham? It was difficult. That Elohim, God, stood before a man. He said, can I hide? Can I hide this thing from Abraham? Is it possible that I will not tell Abraham this secret? He said, no. I will tell him. He's my friend. So he now told Abraham, Abraham, come, let me show you a secret. He said, the destruction of Sodom is at hand. He says, their iniquities have reached up to heaven. It's time for them to be destroyed. Oh, it's time for them to be destroyed. It's a secret. It's a heavenly secret. Those things don't fly. You don't read it in the Bible. You can't read it in the law, in the Torah. You can't find it in scriptures. That somewhere is that. You can't, there are things of God that are in mysteries. They are in his chest. You can't read it in the Bible. You can't. God must commit them to you as a secret. He must commit it to you as a secret. So he told him, Sodom is about to be destroyed. Meanwhile, the one that is inside Sodom did not know that Sodom was about to be destroyed. So he sat down in Sodom. It was on the day of the destruction that God showed him mercy that he came and removed him. Because he was not privy to the secret of God, 
It's on that day that he found out. And because he found out too late, he lost his possession, he lost his property. Everything that he worked for was destroyed in Sodom. Because the secret of God was not given to him. He found out at the last minute. He found out when it was already happening. When it was already happening, that's when he found out. And he lost everything. Because do you know why? He's not, he's, he's not a friend. So that secret cannot be committed to him. He cannot. So there are people in Nigeria today, they are friends of God. Oh. I'm not talking of prophets. They are not prophets. They are just friends of God. And because they are friends of God, God will come to them. He says, my daughter, in four years' time, the dollar will be 1,500. Start saving. Start saving in dollars. You, you sat down here until dollar reach one five, singing and dancing in church. God didn't tell you. Now you are suffering because of exchange rates. It's a secret of God. You can't read it in the Bible that in four years' time, dollar will be 1,005. Where will you see it? It's a secret. It's in God's chest. It's those that are his friends that he will tell. Another one, a friend of God, through obedience, God will reveal to him in his dream. You just sleep one day, and you just see that he dreamt that in 2023, things were so difficult. Everybody was suffering. Things were hard. And he had this dream back in 2009, when things were not as hard. He had this dream at a time when oil prices were skyrocketing and Nigeria was burning. Nigeria was having a lot of money. It was an oil boom. That's when he had this dream. That in 2023, 2024, things would be difficult. And not only did God show him, hmm? God gave him the strategy. This is how you can plan your finances. This is where to invest. This is where to put your money. So that you will not suffer with everybody. So you now, that she from Kito, calling yourself a Christian, you sat down here like Lot until the economy was shattered in pieces. God didn't tell you nothing. You are suffering. You sat down here until inflation is almost 30%. You sat down here until the dollar is 1.5. You sat down here until Nigeria is saddled with debt. You sat down here until prices of food were so expensive. God didn't tell you nothing. And you are suffering. You are like Lot, calling yourself a righteous man. Sat down in Sodom and became poor. Sat down in Sodom and lost everything. Because he's not a friend. But the ones who are friends, he says, shall I hide this from Abraham? Economic ruin is coming, destruction, inflation, suffering. God says, My friends must know. Ah, have you know when you have when you hear that an accident or they are arm robbers somewhere in a particular street? You don't call everybody, you call your friend. You say, I hear that the arm robbers there. Don't go there. So God calls his friends. Things are getting hard. See the strategy. Things are getting hard. Put your money here. Things are getting hard. This is how you can survive this recession. The same way you call your friends, you want them. You don't call everybody. So God called his friend Abraham. This is what's going to happen to Sodom. Lot did not know. So you don't have the secrets of God. So you are suffering. Suffering! Complaining that, that the government has scattered the economy. What's your business? Are you not a Christian? You're supposed to live from heaven. What's your business? What's going on in the economy? Is God not your father? Is, 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 is this government affecting... God's, God's government. Why are you complaining that there's inflation, there's exchange rates, that things are difficult? I thought you were a Christian. I thought God is supposed to provide for you. He's not your father. What's your business? You live from a heavenly economy. Why is this economy affecting you? You are a fornicator. 